We're here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, as you can see, I don't know if you can see the city lights back there. They're absolutely gorgeous. Diamond Head is in the darkness. Uh, but the stars have come out, and this is an interview at night with Dr. Shadi Habal from the Institute of Astronomy. Uh, I know uh, Shadia for quite some time with her interest in eclipses, uh, as I am, but she's one of the foremost uh, researchers for it, and we've, uh, uh, during our careers, uh, uh, we got to meet up, and I actually joined her in, in uh, uh, Svalbard, Norway, right after my stroke, and uh, so uh, I'm having the pleasure here to interview her, and uh, hopefully she start a, a video interviews with uh, with uh, astronomers that, that that I personally know and uh, and because the stuff they tell me is fascinating and and I always felt I need to capture this and share this with other people it is I can't keep it to myself and just share it one on one but to share it with a, a, a large audience as I can but Shadia uh, I'm gonna ask you questions that I probably don't know all I know some things but um, it where did you first go to college? Where did you I, uh, as an undergrad, I went to the University of Damascus. I studied physics and uh, mathematics. And then I went to the American University of Beirut for a master's degree in nuclear physics. And then I ended up at the University of Cincinnati for a PhD in physics. PhD in physics. So, yes. so you're a physics professor. That's what you studied. Uh, and, uh, and then after that, where did, you, where did you go? What kind of work did you do after that? So after my PhD, I was offered a fellowship at uh, the High Altitude Observatory in Boulder. And this is where I started to do research on the sun. Uh, before that, it was more of the, the general uh, idea of uh, magnetized plasmas, which are found anywhere in the universe. OK, so that was your first exposure to the sun mm -hmm. uh, uh, in your 20s, working at a Boulder. Yes. And uh, this is postdoctoral work? Or yes. Yes? Yes. And uh, what did you discover? <laughs> well, I did, uh, I did a research project uh, on, uh, on uh, what we call a special type of waves, which are magnetized uh, sound waves, uh, to see whether these waves can actually impart their energy to the gas and heat the corona. Because the mystery of the corona is still an ongoing mystery, in the sense that the surface of the sun is at 6,000 degrees, and all of a sudden, the temperature rises to a million degrees or more. Okay, so I heard that. I, mm. I, I recall hearing about sound waves as a potential theory mm. for the heating of the corona. Uh. But I guess before we get into that, um, I, well, actually, well, what did you find out? Was there a, cor a correlation or a causation that, that occurred that you think? Yes, we found that these special types of waves, which are not pure sound waves, but they're, they have a magnetic component to them that they can propagate in the medium at strange angles depending on the properties of the medium and they can lose their energy and give it to the plasma and heat it. Sound so waves have a magnetic component to them? The, in, in, a, in the solar atmosphere because the magnetic field plays such an important role. So it's not just pure sound waves. Okay. It's so a it, mixture. It and has the properties of sound waves. Yes. They call them uh, this long name called magnetohydrodynamic waves. Magnetohydrodynamics. Okay, so yeah. waves. I'll have to look that up. Uh -huh. um, so uh, after that, uh, what, what, where did you go from there? So I spent a year in Boulder, and then I uh, went to Harvard to the Center for Astrophysics, and this is where I started to uh, do uh, analysis of data. So. At the time, they had, uh, they had one of the main instruments on the uh, Skylab, which was a... a Skylab? Yes. The one that crashed? Well, a long time ago. <laughs> no, it didn't crash. It was, it was in said, orbit. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. I just remember that. No, this was in the 1970s, and it was really one of the most successful uh, s space labs to look at the sun for an extended period of time. And they e even have three astronauts go up to the space lab to run the equipment. So it was a manned uh, observatory. And they had uh, lots of data in the extreme ultraviolet looking at the solar, uh, directly at the sun, but looking at the corona as projected on the surface of the sun. Because in the extreme ultraviolet, uh, the sun is not, uh, doesn't blind you. Well, you so said looking at the corona projected on the sun? Yes, you're looking at the solar disk. But see, in the visible part of the spectrum, you cannot look at the sun, it's just too bright. But in the extreme ultraviolet, it's not bright because the continuum is not there. Okay. So uh, they took observations 
in different spectral lines and each one of them had a different temperature signature. So they, dis they discovered or they confirmed the presence of these darker regions called coronal holes where uh, people believe that this is where uh, the, the particles from the sun escape predominantly. And then there were a whole slew of uh, fine scale structures on, in the corona that they so discovered. So this was all happening in the 1970s. Yes. And you, you're doing these observations from space, right? I in, didn't do in, them at the time. They were collected already. Collected? Yes. Yeah, so right. I was just analyzing the data right. that they had acquired. But they were spa space-based data. Yes. That yes. you were analyzing. Mm -hmm. And in the 70s, now I, I happen to know this personally, but you didn't see your first eclipse until... 95. 1995. Yeah. And now, after that, so where did it lead up to the eclipses? Hey, what's the story behind that? Okay, so for uh, a number of years, almost uh, almost two decades, I was working on doing uh, both uh, analysis of the Skylab data and also doing some model calculations to try to understand uh, really the properties of what we call the solar wind. Basically, it's the, the corona that's expanding into space. And that uh, expansion was given the name solar wind by uh, Eugene Parker in 1958. So for many people were involved in trying to understand why are there different types of solar wind. Some of them are fast, some of them are slow, etc. And to understand the properties of the different components of the solar wind. So I had done a lot of work and one of the parameters that we needed to, to find for, uh, to confirm our modeling was the temperature in the corona. So there were lots of published, uh, the, the information, the, the values of the temperatures ranged, uh, were almost varied by a factor of two, which was really too much to, con to constrain any model. And uh, I, uh, I realized that I had read about people doing eclipse observations and that they are unique opportunities because you can observe the sun starting right at the surface and all the way out to several solar radii. Okay, yeah. as I know, mm. where the, the moon is the, uh, covering the photosphere, the last bit, it's actually masking neatly because it's mm -hmm. they're perfect, the uh, spheres are so, so close and you're getting this perfect mass where the photosphere and then the chromosphere begins and then goes on to the corona. Okay, but let's go back a step now. Mm -hmm. The studies into the solar wind. Um, can you tell me about like the importance of that and, and, and that it was named by Eugene Parker in 1958 and that uh, you're, you're studying this. You're seeing that there are different speeds uh, mm -hmm. coming out of it. And how is this like, really? I mean, I know it's probably a dumb question, but how is this related in talking about the star, the sun being a star? You know, mm -hmm. what is it like? How, what do you think you can learn by studying that? What uh, you know, what the star is? Uh, you can learn uh, actually um, why does the star, we know that the star spews out different elements and we know uh, I mean, because it's, a, it's a, an ionized uh, gas in the corona, it's mostly electrons and protons. But there are also trace elements, iron, carbon, uh, silicon, magnesium, everything is there in, uh, in small concentrations. But each one of them is telling us a story which we need to explore to really understand how the sun is actually uh, behaving or how does it start to expand, you know, from its surface outwards. What is really triggering all this expansion? Okay, and this, mm. and and, mm. and and I know this relates to space weather here on Earth, yes. right? Yes. This is what this is the stuff that affects us because it's the stuff that's coming out of the sun, mm. and it actually hits us uh, here on Earth continuously, well, c continuously. Yes, right, and it has effects for us with uh, with what, for instance. Uh, uh, spacecraft and, uh, and radio well before uh, before the spacecraft even I mean uh, the the solar wind is uh, escaping from the Sun at different speeds from different parts of the, the solar surface and it's just e expanding everywhere all around the surface of the Sun and as it's expanding it goes past all the bodies in the solar system you know but the most uh, for us the most important one to worry about is the earth now the Earth has a magnetic shield, uh, and uh, that shield is pretty strong because 
the particles from the solar wind can't penetrate directly into the Earth's atmosphere. They end up spiraling along the magnetic field lines, and their penetration is mostly in the polar regions, and that's where you can get the aurora. So you get the aurora. So mm -hmm. we're protected by this shield. Mm -hmm. What's the name of it? It's the magnetosphere of the Earth. Magnetosphere. So we're yeah. protected. Th these these rays they can be dangerous to life, right? If we were to be exposed to them directly. Uh, the energetic amounts. ones, yes. The energetic yeah, ones. Yeah. So now they come in, they hit this this magnetosphere, and then they follow these the new path almost immediately. Yeah, they're funneled it, into the and they funnel polar into region. the poles and then come yeah. down there. Yes. Is that why no one's living at the poles? No. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Okay, so space weather is a big thing right now, and what we know about the sun and the mm. corona, is that's how that relates. Okay, so um, how many eclipses, so at some point you, you made that decision that you were going to start observing solar eclipses on the ground. Yes, and it was uh, uh, somewhat of an amusing uh, start, because I, uh, I had never done any observations. I was a theorist, I had analyzed data, but then I was flipping through sky and telescope, and I this sky and telescope, great. Yeah, so I this I found out that uh, Nikon and Kodak had come up with uh, a digital camera where uh, the top was a, a single lens reflex camera, and the bottom was a, a chip that Kodak had developed. So you basically had a camera that was writing onto a chip, and the whole thing was portable. So I thought, well, this is perfect for an eclipse expedition. So this is how it started, and I wrote a proposal to NASA and uh, to get funding. I talked to two people I knew who worked at NASA at Goddard, Dick Fisher and Lika Gohatakurta, and, uh, and so we teamed up together and wrote the proposal, and it was funded. So the proposal was basically to buy these cameras because they were rather expensive at the time. They were about $15,000 and to go to a, to observe the sun, uh, the corona during a total solar eclipse. And were you successful? The first, yes, in 95 was the first eclipse. It was very, very short, 42 seconds, but we managed to get images of the corona with these cameras. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. And you got uh, d these images and data. Did you, did you find anything new from that from at the time? Was uh, at the time, we didn't quite understand. Uh, see, what we uh, it wasn't just looking at the corona as is. We had special filters. And the filters singled out uh, the light that was coming from iron. Iron that was ionized uh, nine times and iron that was ionized 13 times. So what we call iron 10 and iron 14. And they uh, are reflect different temperatures in, in the corona. One is at a million degrees, the other is two million. So we, uh, the, the pictures we got looked different, uh, but at the time I didn't realize that one has to do a little more. I mean, we knew about taking different exposure times and putting together all these images, but what we were lacking in expertise were processing the images. So we got signals and we got a, the, the corona that uh, you get in most photographic films but uh, we weren't able to get as much science out okay. of it as but we wanted. But it was good with those cameras. It was yes. something unique and new. Yeah. And then you continued and uh, this yeah, type so of research? Yes, so this was uh, the beginning of more or less, you would say, scientific addiction because we realized mm -hmm. that we should do better and uh, we needed uh, to get uh, better filters. And the cameras were, at the time, working fine uh, in the sense that they were portable. But uh, the cameras had, um, you couldn't get the data raw. They, they had an internal processing that was uh, rescaling the, okay. the, 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 the counts. Okay. And this is, we discovered that limitation much later. Okay. So then we, uh, then another manufacturer came around uh, pr producing cameras which were more scientific. Now, as you're doing these ground-based observations, mm -hmm. there are space-based observations going on. Mm -hmm. And then you're planning for the next eclipse. And then maybe NASA or some other uh, company is launching another spacecraft with new technology. Was there a tit-for-tat type of competition going on? Was there a point where uh, you know, ground-based observations were showing things that space weren't at any time? Was there a lot of that? Because I do know that now mm -hmm. that there are some great science coming out of ground-based observations. Mm. But I'd like to know the lead-up to that. What's that history between space and ground? 
Yes, so uh, f as far as I was concerned, well, mean, or, or in general? In general, all of In it. general, mm -hmm. well, uh, what happened is uh, from space you could observe in the extreme ultraviolet. So it's part of the uh, wavelength range that the eye cannot see and you have to be in space. The advantage of it is you can look directly at the sun. But then the intensity of the light drops very quickly. So you can see maybe a quarter of a radius above the surface of the sun. You can see the surface and above it by a quarter. But then the intensity of the light just drops very quickly. At the time, uh, I, I don't think many people realized why it was the case. Uh, in the visible, uh, during an eclipse, you can see much further away. So we re recognize that they really had something to, to give us that the, the space was not, in the sense that you uh, see, as the gas is evolving with the magnetic field, as, there, as it's leaving the solar surface, you want to be able to follow this evolution. But when something just cuts off the light, you don't know what happens to it afterwards. And with the eclipses, we could see a little bit further out. Now, the same uh, in tandem uh, around the the spacecraft called SOHO was launched in 1995 also at the at, uh, okay. when we started the eclipse observations. And they had what we call a coronagraph. And the coronagraphs was, were first, uh, uh, it was invented by Leo in the 30s and then it was uh, installed on, a, on the ground, on the ground-based observatories. With the coronagraph, what happens is you don't, you can't get right smack to the surface of the sun. You lose the first tenths of two tenths. There's a fear of, of damaging the instruments. No, no, it? it's just you have diffraction patterns. Oh, and uh, they okay. kind of mess up what's close to the sun. And then you can go a little bit further out. But again, what happens is from the ground, uh, the sky is too bright. Even if you're blocking the disk of the sun, you cannot block the background sky significantly. Uh -huh. During an eclipse, because the moon is such a huge occulter, the, the sky turns into nighttime, and therefore you can see the corona much further away. So you're able to follow the evolution much further oh. away. Okay. And even though it was a few seconds to a few minutes, uh, we recognized that this was important enough to pursue it. So there was a niche in the observations, whether coming from the ground or from space, that there was something missing and only the eclipse observations could fill it. Because you could see, you could observe from the surface all the way out to several solar radii. So you could really follow the evolution. And but they cannot do this in space? No, no, no nothing is like nothing. it. And so what we did, we always, we've been doing this since then, is you look at the space-based observations, you have your eclipse data, and you try to put oh, everything together to get the full story. Okay. And uh, how many expeditions ha have you gone on and d done research? Uh, 15. 15? Yes. Uh, so 2017 F was the 15. 27. All yeah. right. Uh, let's go right to 2017. Uh -huh. This is really the big one, the Great American Eclipse, uh, an opportunity that I, well, I knew of it when I was 14 after seeing my first eclipse in 1979 in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, when was the next one in America? 2017. And it's already come and it went. It's, it's going and went. And uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, what an amazing show. What an amazing show for me, uh, visually, and to be involved in outreach and uh, working with the American Astronomical Society and NASA and such. Um, but for you, it was an opportunity. I could imagine that uh, from coast to coast where we may be able to see changes in the sun in, in this 90 minutes that the path is traveling and, or an, and an opportunity to set up multiple stations across the, the country and also technology. So um, uh, what were your plans prior? What were, you, what were your thinking? What, you, what were you going to do? Like, you know, how are you going to approach this eclipse? What did you do? So five years before that eclipse, I started... Uh, I was thinking very, very seriously about having multiple stations across the country, uh, a minimum of 10. This was my original thinking. And there were several reasons for that. One is to maximize our chances of obtaining the observations because many times the weather uh, just kills you and you don't get anything. Uh, so 
And then the other one is to really observe the variations in the corona over, such, uh, over the 90 minutes from coast to coast. Now, as, uh, at the same time, I also realized that I had an obligation towards, uh, uh, towards the community and the, po uh, the public uh, to uh, alert them to this event. And uh, I initiated the first workshop in 2012 with uh, funding from uh, the National Science Foundation where uh, we had it in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, we tried to contact as many people as I knew, and people I knew contacted others to publicize it, so that uh, experts or eclipse, uh, avid eclipse chasers came, and scientists came together, and we started to brainstorm as to what we should do. So I spent a lot of energy, and eventually the American Astronomical Society established a task force, and then I I chaired the task force with Angela Speck. Uh, so all along I was doing two things, trying to uh, prepare the public for this, and at the same time I was starting to plan for our scientific eclipse observations. Now in the meantime there were other eclipses, like in 20, uh, 2013 there was an eclipse in, in Africa, in 2015 there was the eclipse in Svalbard, 2016 in Indonesia. So. There were a lot of things that were happening during the time period where we started to prepare for the big right. American eclipse. So all this was a very, very uh, work-intensive period of time. And, uh, and at the end, I realized that, one, I didn't have enough funding to, to, be, to have this ambitious goal of 10, uh, 10 uh, stations across the country because we have lots of scientific equipment and it also requires uh, getting more people involved, training them to run the equipment, and we need electricity in the different places. And usually I try to be in somewhat remote places. I don't like to be in city centers because uh, you don't want the uh, light pollution, you don't want and people... And that does affect the, it, because I, I, I've noticed there have been discussions about that. Mm -hmm. To be in a city where it could have light pollution, it, it, could, it could affect your, your yes. results. Yes, so uh, we tried to find uh, uh, sites where we were either private properties or, or public parks uh, or private parks and, and so on. So like state parks and, and uh, federal parks and so on. And then uh, the funding situation was such that I didn't have enough money to get uh, equipment. I, I also uh, wanted to try uh, new equipment. And uh, for example, so far we were observing the sun in different uh, uh, spectral lines that are uh, characteristic of iron. And we wanted to expand into other elements like argon or calcium. And each system is expensive, so uh, if you want to have the identical one across five stations, it costs a lot right. of money. So, mm. what did you end up doing? I mean, all this so, we happened. ended up uh, having five stations. We chose uh, the western part of the country because the weather statistics looked better and we needed to maximize our chances. So, we ended up having a station in uh, uh, Oregon and then in uh, Idaho. Uh, two in Wyoming and one in Nebraska. Okay, five, six, five. five. Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, how did they work out each each one? Well, we were uh, weather-wise, so let's say. Yes, we all lucked out. Lucked I mean, out, all yes, five. Yes, the weather didn't look so great because of the forest fires in in yeah. Oregon and western U.S. before the eclipse, but somehow, by some miracle, everything cleared up at the, the day of the eclipse. Uh -huh. Okay, what kind of equipment did you have and what did you do? What, what did you observe? So we have different types of cameras and uh, different types of lenses. Some of them uh, are just to look at the sun, uh, the corona, like what the eye sees, what we call white light. So you take a camera with uh, the different focal length lenses and you take pictures. Uh, the other set of cameras were ones which we, where we put a, a special filter that singles out the, this emission from iron, you know, the light that comes from iron, and different, different uh, states of iron. So we had, uh, we had those at every site. And then we also had a spectrometer at, at, at uh, four of the five sites. And the reason we couldn't do on the fifth one, because it was up at 10,000 feet in Whiskey Mountain, 
and it was impossible to run such an experiment okay. there. So we only had four uh, spectrometers. So, uh, and that was a much more sophisticated system to run. You need, need to be really trained to do it. The others were a l lot easier to run. So we got enough volunteers, scientists, and uh, uh, you know, avid uh, uh, observers who volunteered to come along. So at the end, we ended up with about 35 people all together across the country uh, in the places. five sites. Yeah. And I also involved lots of young people. Uh, many people wanted to bring their children, and I said it's fine because, after all, we really want to educate the younger yeah. people and we want to expose them to this. Uh, the, the whole um, effort to educate the public, and then the, we, la the least we could do the is to have a lasting impression, because that's what it did yeah. for me when I went with the Vanderbilt Planetarium and the Hayden Planetarium. At 14 years old, I was the youngest person on the expedition, mm -hmm. and uh, boy, did it impress me that I didn't mm -hmm. even know such things were happening, going out to study an eclipse, this outdoor laboratory thing, and, mm -hmm. uh, and the eclipse in itself being so beautiful uh, as they are. Um, so if I can ask, uh, I know you're still studying your, your data, but what have you found out on this eclipse? This is a real big one. You, you, you got these five sites. It's your biggest probably uh, out of mm. all you've done. And uh, I know uh, in Washington at the AAS conference, you presented something about prominences, which I hadn't heard before, uh, not being an expert by far, but uh, something very interesting there. Can, can you talk about that? Yes. So prominences uh, appear during total solar eclipses. It's, it's the red thing. And, and yeah. if any of you know my 2016 crazy video, I'm screaming prominences, prominences out of uh, flight, the Alaska Flight 870. But uh, you can actually see them with your naked eye. They, yes. they, they extend and you see these little red tips out there. And they're flickering all the time. They, the, they're, they're the most variable uh, things on the, uh, in the okay, corona. I didn't know that. Most, okay, so yeah, that's if what, you're can you explain looking, that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, just, uh, they're just moving, uh, like flames moving. And uh, <sighs> so uh, it was only w with the invention of the spectrometer that people uh, who did eclipse observations in the 1800s and so on figured out that the prominences were, uh, were, had this pinkish hue because they were made of mostly of hydrogen, neutral hydrogen. So uh, the, the surprise was here are these very cool and dense structures protruding into a very, very hot corona. So a hundred times hotter and a hundred times less tenuous. So the prominences are, you can almost think about them as an ice cube in an oven, but they're not melting. Ice cube in the oven, yeah. not melting. Yes. Okay. <laughs> wow. So what we discovered is actually whenever you saw a prominence, the material that was, they were always surrounded by arches in the corona, and these arches were at 2 million degrees, invariably, in every single eclipse. So is that the hotter end of it? Yes. So the, the these coolest things were surrounded. It's almost like it had a hat or a yeah. shroud of the hottest material. Wow. But then from uh, space-based observations and, uh, and also ground-based, uh, prominences are known to be very active. They change a lot and they sometimes just start to, uh, you know, grow and grow up and uh, move up into the corona and then they snap. And they, is that and where they detach and you can yes. actually see them? So you, th you, they detach, but then the question is what happens to the material when it detaches? Some pictures give you the impression that the material starts to rain back at the sun, but not all of it. And then you think, well, what else happened? So what the first time we discovered what could be happening was in 2015 in the eclipse in Svalbard, where we found that some of this cool material was actually escaping from the sun into interplanetary space. And then in 2017, we found the same thing. We found a big a, a lot of this cool material from prominences uh, just spread out in the corona and just moving outward. This was recent discovery. You're seeing yes. that in there. Be yes. Um, because it seems to fit now when you're looking at it, you see it there as the material thing. And then when you look at the, the structure of the corona, you may see like a little eye shape type of projection outline or contour going out. And this could be part of this uh, ejection or this this the stuff going out. And this does lead to the CME, if I can say. Yes. This is it? Yes, because the prominences, they, they're, 
you know, as I said, we found that they're enshrouded with the hottest material. So it seems like when they erupt or they snap, they just push with them this envelope and they go out together and this strong, a big, large envelope or is what people call a coronal mass ejection because it just, it's a huge bubble that keeps on escaping into space. And it's one of the dangers, what we call dangers of space weather because if they're, they're traveling at enormous speeds and they carry a lot of momentum, they interact with the Earth's magnetic environment and they can actually damage, uh, because of large currents produced uh, in, during that interaction, they can damage uh, communication satellites. So this is like a, a very powerful uh, ejection or a part yeah. of it. It's like a, yeah. it's a concentrated thing, only like a yeah. bullet coming out of there. Yeah. And uh, when you say snap, this is a magnetic field line yes. snapping? Because yes. I, I, I don't understand that concept. I mean, It's a strange thing. It's like you're taking a rubber band and you're twisting it, twisting it, twisting it. And after and a the, while... And, and the rubber band is the magnetic field line? Yes, yes. And then after a while, you twist it so much that it just snaps. It's, lit it's like uh, almost literally yeah. snaps. And yes. then that releases it because it's, it's being yes, tethered in some way? Yes, but what we found, what we found from the eclipse observations also, that uh, it's a complex uh, rubber band. It's not just one band. It's almost like a, like a bundle. And the bundle snaps, but it seems like some of the strands stay, at stay attached to the sun. And that's what we have found in different eclipse observations uh, in the white light is that they stay, that they stay tethered to the sun, and they just keep on going. So they're stretching almost to infinity, but they're still attached to the sun. Oh, and I I, I recall you telling me uh, actually a year ago about the properties of magnetic field lines, where uh, a temperature of of, of the corona could be a million degrees at one end and a million degrees in the other because the property can extend on this magnetic field line? Yes, because you, uh, they're highly conductive, so you have a very high conduction along the magnetic field line. So it's like when you heat uh, a pot or something, depending on the material of the pot. Sometimes the handles can, can get hot, sometimes they don't. Well, uh, the magnetic fields are just its instantaneous conduction of the heat. Instantaneous. Yes, almost. I mean, it goes it's very fast. Very close to yeah. the speed of light. Well, and not now, quite, but it's, it's very. It's like electricity fast. in some yes, way. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, um, what? What else have you have you gotten out of it? Uh, you know, this eclipse out of 2017, discovery wide. What are you looking uh, for? So, what we found is, first of all, we uh, the the. Um, the quality of our filters and the optics was much better than before. And we managed to get uh, images that had superb resolution. So when we looked, so you can see finer details much better than before. And we know that when you look at the corona in different uh, ir uh, iron uh, stages of iron ionized to different states, you can see different temperatures. But here what we got was we we did see that and when you put the two pic when you look at the two pictures separately let's say you're looking at iron 11 and iron 14 the corona looks different and you're wondering you know are we looking at the same object well they look different because you're looking at different temperatures and when you superimpose the two images by choosing uh, you know colors for each one you can see how there is a clear distinction between it's almost like you're wearing your hand is cold, your shirt is hot, and you can tell exactly where the hot material stops and the cold material is. Okay. So, so there is a distribution, and the importance of this is that we know that corona is hot, but when we want to look for processes of why it's hot, we have to find something that says, in this place you're going to get a million degrees, but in this place you're going to get two million. So you have to come up with a the, the physics that tells you there is a distribution of temperatures. It's not all uniformly hot. So you have to come up with the physics. So here we've yeah. observed something, and now you have to come up with the math or the yes. formulas to work. Yes, like, uh, for example, uh, I mean, a, like the, the forces of gravity that were discovered, Newton's laws of gravity. Here we don't really know, know exactly what is causing the corona 
to be hot and why does it choose in one place it decides it's a million degrees in another place it's two million. And why does it do we know not yet no <laughs> we know that everything as as the material starts to flow outwards it cools and therefore the streams that are going away from the sun you expect them to be cooler but everything that's attached to the sun is not going to get cooler because it it will cool by radiation but not a lot but it does eventually cool, no? Or it no? Does, no, uh, everything that's just... like an arch, it stays hot. Eventually, it's going to snap or something is going to break. The magnetic field lines will break and then the material will be will just like released into interplanetary space. And when it reaches us, is it still hot? Does it still have that energy? Uh, yes, it, it cools down uh, a bit, but not a, in, um, like a factor of 10, but not much more. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it loses some energy in its travels. Yes. Yeah. Um, right, wh 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 where are we going next? I mean, there's another eclipse in 2019. Yes. And uh, uh, do you already have ideas of things that you may want to look into? Yes, further? I'd like to explore. As I said, I wanted to explore other elements in 2017, but we didn't have enough money. We didn't get the uh, funding. So I'm hoping now if uh, that NSF or NASA will provide us with more funding that we can try to explore. So far we've done iron in great detail, but we'd like to look at other elements. Because and you did the, get to do argon in this one. We did argon. one argon line yeah. and it Continuum. turned out to be very weak. Uh, so uh, for a long time scientists, solar scientists and he, uh, people who look at the solar wind in interplanetary space, uh, the the argon was very very uh, dilute. Very little argon was there. So the question was, why is it? Uh, why do we have such copious amounts of iron and very little argon? So we wanted to image argon in the corona, and it turned out that one of the ionization states of argon, which we looked at, was very very weak. So you saw the distribution. Uh, and it, so we know that it's because of uh, the quantity. I mean, it's just not as abundant as iron. It's not a temperature. Uh, so here we're probing into not just the properties of the corona, but also the chemical composition of the corona. And this is what we're, we're getting at, or we're trying to get at when we do spectroscopy and also when we do imaging, you know, in different wavelengths. So we choose, we choose the filter that tells us this filter corresponds to argon or this filter corresponds to calcium or to silicon or sulfur. And we observe the sun in these different filters and we then can tell where these elements are distributed in the corona. So we're, we're probing the chemical composition of the corona. Why is the corona so beautiful? Because it's shaped by the magnetic field lines. Wait, no, it? I'm asking you why it's beautiful. How I, can I you? <laughs> it is absolutely gorgeous when people yes, see it. You know, yes, I mean, the, I, just I the filaments. It. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I mean, aesthetically, it, uh -huh. is, it is so. Why is this? Why does it take on for us uh, such a feeling? You know, why is it so? It, it really that is the thing that sticks in your mind seeing that mm -hmm. corona mm -hmm. for the first time. It's a light that we have not seen before. It's a polarized light, mm -hmm. uh, essentially. Um, but it, we're seeing a part of the sun we haven't seen before, which is always there. Yes, it's exactly. By, by but the, because the, light. The, the, the sun itself is so bright, it, it, you can't see the corona exactly. except during a total solar eclipse. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to have to end this uh, yeah. uh, now at um, this beautiful night here in Honolulu. But. Uh, I can't believe how much is cleared up, but I want to thank uh, so much Dr. Shadi Habal and uh, wish her all the best with her continuing uh, research and studies and such. And I hope to join you and learn more about it, but um, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Thank you.